much, Paolo, for that lovely introduction. Uh, thank you to all of you who have found your way. Um, I found myself standing in the other theater announcing that I was the keynote speaker in the auditorium. <laughs> so I kind of scurried here, and I'm glad to say that many of you have found your way here. Let me start by saying thank you so much to uh, the local organizers and the national organizers of this uh, conference. What a wonderful occasion to have it here in Italy and also in Bolzano. Um, a beautiful setting for ECER to celebrate uh, not only the expansion of ECER, but uh, the proliferation of networks and the opportunities for various colleagues around the world to come together and to dialogue. Paolo said that I had changed the first part of the title of my presentation, and indeed I have, uh, Governing Through Quantification. Uh, it invokes, nevertheless, uh, through Flat Earth, which I'll begin to explore, this idea that you set aside settings. Con context or place is increasingly less relevant uh, in the politics of quantification. So I want to explore the contradictory dynamics of what I'm calling flat earth, uh, ordinalization, and cold spot education policies. And indeed, uh, cold spot uh, does refer at the current time to the way in which the UK government and the Commission on Social Mobility uh, decide uh, or, or, or define those who've uh, missed out on the race to be a, a competitive individual um, and so on. So this is a real language that's currently in use, uh, but like all real languages, they emerge from somewhere, they have interests behind them, and they do important kind of work. Now I want to be quite ambitious uh, for the moment, and I want to start my presentation by saying, uh, though I'm hoping to set some agendas around the quantification, uh, or the sociology of quantification, um, I by no means am uh, at the lead of these kinds of developments. Many of you in the audience, and I won't name you, but you know who you are, um, because for sure I'll miss one or two of you out. But there's a group of people doing magnificent work, and mine, I hope, is simply a modest uh, contribution to that larger project. Um, I'm calling it a sociology of quantification, in part because I actually want to move some of the discussion, some of the agenda away from a politics of quantification. And by focusing on a sociology of quantification, what I'm actually wanting to propose is that we focus specifically on how new social processes, relations, identities, outcomes, um, and what I'm going to call, borrowing from Marion Foucault, forms of unhingement. Okay, so I will take you there. I'm going to start by actually arguing that our current accounts of governing through quantification are ontologically flat and don't, don't explain the how of social processes, relations, and outcomes. In other words, we move quite quickly from, and, and I'll kind of chart this, from the, the discourse through to the performativity. Um, and that's fine doing that kind of work, but the, the, it sort of black boxes the processes at work. And I'll argue what it does do in black boxing those processes of work. We don't actually see how new forms of social inequalities, uh, new forms of exclusion, new forms of inclusion um, are currently being produced. So I'm going to uh, argue today uh, that our research programs need a much more complex conceptual grammar to help build a sociology of quantification and governing through the state uh, and this is uh, De Rosier was much more interested. He's the um, key individual in uh, these kinds of circles. But his was much more around the state and public action. And as many of you in the audience will know, increasingly governan governing also happens through the market. And the quantification of governing through the market, aided by the state, is something that we would want to think about. I want to draw together so it is not the case that there are no resources uh, out there. It is not the case that this is uh, a completely new agenda. Uh, 
but I want to uh, make some suggestions as to how we might gather together some of the ways in which uh, we make sense of the world. Uh, and I don't mean sociologists, capital S, but all of us in this room that are very concerned about education and the social processes at work, so small s social, at work, that begin to produce, shape social, produce uh, opportunities, shape social lives, um, form systems, uh, structure, norms, opportunities, and so on. And these are the elements that I actually want to uh, suggest uh, need to be brought together, and I'll uh, conclude by uh, bringing those together in uh, a new kind of nomenclature that we might begin to think with. So one element of it is code makers, forms of categorization, uh, forms of commensuration, algorithms, uh, it should be platforms and measurement, uh, the politics of representation, processes of recontextualization. So for the Bernsteinians in the audience, uh, this is a really important contribution of Bernstein's work that's absent in many of the current accounts, and practices including affect and unhingement. And by bringing these together, what I hope to do is to shed new light on classical sociological problems, such as the way particular social processes, relations, practices, identities are made visible and some invisible, and in making them visible, it also makes them potentially governable. So sociologists, uh, Roger Dale, who's in the audience today, uh, James Scott, much later on, and many others in the education field, have had a long-standing interest uh, in the role of the state uh, in governing. And this is James Scott on the state and seeing like a state. Um, and he has this to say about the way the state does see uh, a population. Okay? So it, uh, uh, it uh, identifies a, a territory and it uh, produces out of that territory citizens who uh, it works very hard to um, develop notions of nation, belonging, um, and so on. But this is about governing and it's about rule. So the legibility of a society provides the capacity for large-scale social engineering. High modernist ideology provides the desire, and I'll take you, I've spent a little bit of time on the post-war period. The authoritarian state pro provides the determination to act on that desire, and an incapacitated civil society, if indeed it's incapacitated, provides the levels of societal terrain on which to build. So, to some extent, uh, incapacity uh, means forms of pacification, so that the, the, the project the, and the objects of governing can take place. However, this leads to a flat earth way of uh, looking at the world. And in the flattening of that world, what we do is we generate all kinds of equivalences between those uh, individuals, for example, whose social situations are uh, profoundly unequal. It genera generates equivalences between nations whose histories uh, we, we would recognize are um, completely different uh, in terms of their states of development, levels of colonization. So it is kind of at this moment, post-colonial theory would become particularly uh, important. Governing populations and nations is dependent on the development of categories, says Mongia, that in turn enable the standardization of inequality through the form of equivalence. So this is deep structural equivalent, uh, inequalities that simply uh, exist there. They remain, uh, except that now they're brought into an equivalence of possibly equals, but nevertheless they are actually different. And we can see the way the OECD does this through uh, seeing like the OECD. Okay? Uh, it would take a look at uh, all parts of the world that have signed up to the various programs of the OECD, uh, and indeed the OECD looks well beyond those member states of the OECD. And it flattens a country like Australia, for example. Um, most of the dwellings are around on the, uh, the periphery um, of Australia, uh, not much in the middle. Um, 
rural and uh, urban divides simply go missing. The fact that this is a federal state uh, with no constitutional responsibility for governing education, uh, again, is also missing in here. Um, and the view that all of these states would be in some kind of equivalent relationship to each other, for example, the uh, quite large indigenous population in the Northern Territory, simply now is uh, made uh, invisible. So the OECD as a kind of para-state, uh, partly because of the seeding of significant uh, governing uh, capacities to the OECD from the post-war period onward, uh, have actually uh, generated a really significant governing capacity for the OECD, and that matters in the world of education. Now, governing requires complex processes uh, of, of, of making things uh, visible. And what I want to suggest today by using alternate examples is that making, and this is a politics of representation, making complex social and political processes visible, like the economy, uh, forms of exchange and so on, requires that we actually invest in ways of representing those things that we simply can't see. They're not out there. They're not um, identifiable material objects. They are wound up, tied together in quite complex social relations um, that we might call uh, uh, ec the economy, as it were. Uh, Polanyi uh, pointed to this, uh, so the economy doesn't sit out there, the economy is actually deeply embedded in social uh, orders and social institutions and social relations. And I want to look uh, specifically at the 1930s and the uh, period of the Depression as, a, as an alternate example um, of the way in which we made the economy uh, visible. And here you actually have Kindleberger, who generates, and we'll see this shortly, um, a way of trying to represent the increasingly increasing decline into global depression. But at this particular point, uh, Slobodian, who's Quinn Slobodian, who's written uh, a, a recent book on uh, the globalists, um, actually looks at the way in which, for the first time in the 1930s, the idea of a global economy is proposed. Uh, in the Paris Fair in 1937, there were all kinds of uh, modes of representation. And here what you see on the right-hand side is this idea of a lighthouse, that if actually somehow we could actually have a kind of almost a god optic on the world, we would actually be able to shed light on the global economy. And the idea of, uh, and the hope for that so-called flat earth, which actually emerged out of the 1920s, um, actually becomes uh, very not a flat earth, tariff protections and so on, leading into the Depression years. So at this particular point, the economists get to work, and many of them we would recognize as those who were the proposers, ultimately, of neoliberal projects and so on. Um, so this, the, the ways to actually re represent the global economy. Um, so this is the... Uh, the, the spider graph that we might recognize, uh, and you'll see me using it uh, uh, in more recent representations, the World Bank, the OECD, uh, many of the research councils um, are actually using the Kindleberger representation. But we see the steady kind of cycling in right until the 1930s of the decline of the global economy. Okay? But there had not been a notion of a global economy. The economists that got to work in the 1930s also mused amongst themselves. Uh, they wanted to control the economy. Uh, at the same time, uh, Hayek himself argued that it was fundamentally important that the economists shouldn't know everything. We sh they shouldn't be able to see and understand and control everything. Because of course, for Hayek, essentially, information uh, didn't, shouldn't actually be located in and amongst the economists, but actually should be freely distributed uh, amongst the wider society, information that kept the market going. Um, but here, um, and Slobodian actually develops what he calls barometer vision. Uh, this idea of the, the, the kind of the, the air pressure, okay, so the economy could be measured now using this idea of air pressure, barometer vision. If we could 
use a way of representing the ups and downs of the economy? Is it overheating, underheating, and so on? This would actually give uh, both the economists and those who are planning the economy, trying to manage the economy, uh, ways of actually um, understanding the health of the economy. Okay? And to some extent, it gave the economists who are pushing for a, an economics of science or a science of economics um, a kind of mystical kind of uh, quality about their, uh, the tools that they actually used. But there was some degree of skepticism, even amongst the, the uh, kind of the liberal, neoliberal kind of camps. Um, and here, these would have been um, uh, Geneva, Freiburg, and so on, um, where essentially people like Hayek, to the end of his period of time, um, was located. So ways of representing, these are, these are ways of representing, but they do depend on categories. And here I actually want to uh, draw on uh, Daniel Troller's lovely and recent work um, on uh, looking particularly at the early years of the OECD, um, but from the paper Teachers College Press that, uh, or Teachers College, um, uh, a really nice paper in 2013, looking at the way in which in the post-war period that world was cut up. Um, and I want you to take note of the fact that the world was categorized into simply at this particular point four quadrants, okay? rather different from the more hierarchical ones that we'll get to see um, in a moment. So new theories began to emerge to explain world orders and their relations, and modernization theory uh, in the post-war period uh, reaches its apogee, um, uh, particularly by the middle uh, 60s, later, later 60s, and then into a period of decline. But the world was represented this way, the developed, and here's a conundrum, really, for the, those claiming. So the US claimed US exceptionalism, um, but it also saw those who were in the other quadrants uh, having an aspiration to ultimately move toward the model of development that was essentially that, uh, the, the space that the US actually occupied. A contradiction, of course, because essentially you can't claim exceptionalism, but at the same time have it there as a pinnacle for achievement and an aspiration for those countries that were the developing countries. The underdeveloped countries uh, first named uh, actually um, by Eisenhower, who uh, essentially uh, then begins to worry about what happens to that part of the world, the, um, those countries that were now seeking um, their own um, autonomy here, the post-war states. And essentially, you know what's in this last quadrant, which was wrong development, which was actually the Soviet uh, trajectory, um, and those countries uh, wrong-headed uh, development. Um, a form of modernization, indeed, of course, but essentially uh, committed to a different kind of ideology. Now, my point in presenting this to you here is that actually the categories that we use to represent the world actually matter. They do important kind of work. Um, and, of course, uh, modernization theorists, and there were different camps of those, um, but those modernization theorists uh, offered us a theory of the world that moved between tradition and superstition. Uh, Parsons at the helm here, um, important sociologist, uh, sets up actually a different department actually in Harvard, recruits Clifford Getz and others into that department, um, and they begin the work of this kind of uh, big macro sociological theory that actually gets bought into and uh, becomes incredibly important. So these categories, developed, underdeveloped, and so on, which stay with us today, are actually forms of what Foucault would talk about as nominalization. They are nominal judgments, and they define what things are, or people, okay? The economies, developed, underdeveloped, and so on. And again, we use these, this kind of language, um, and in that process, we can see the flattening of the world into uh, four quadrants. They purport to describe some intrinsic character and relation, that kind of thing. Um, but already by the late 1960s in the United States, this is a project that's deeply in trouble uh, internally in the United States, the civil rights movements, uh, this idea that actually it wasn't the perfect uh, nation and so on. Actually, 
uh, results in a scuppering of the modernization project of at least some of its features. But it consists in conceptual acts of categorical design, interpretive acts of fitting. Um, now, if we go to Bernstein, it seems to me that what we can do if we're beginning to now think of um, the first bit of actually this agenda for um, developing uh, a, a kind of a sociology of quantification is that what we're making categories, of course, um, and we later begin to measure those, but Bernstein actually suggests to it there's, there's a prior stage. Okay? So those in control of developing and coding and making these nominal judgments, a la the Parsons and so on, some of our um, important colleagues, are described by Bernstein as dominating the field of symbolic control. And some of the work that I've done with uh, Tor Sorensen uh, heads in this kind of direction. The OECD is a master encoder in that sense. And so prior to thinking of nominalization, um, code, m the code makers, those who occupy the field of symbolic control, as Bernstein describes it, is actually in an important addition to an agenda uh, to do with a sociology of quantification. Governing requires ideational and institutional work and material resources, and we might actually look at uh, the rise of the OECD and other multilateral organizations. And the example here I'll look at is something I've done a, a great deal of work on over the, uh, the last 10 or so years. But the way in which uh, education is made uh, as the equivalents of education, so generating these equivalents uh, between, or forms of commensuration, between education and the delivery of a knowledge-based economy. Okay. However, you see an, another flattening of the earth. Education now is simply human capital. Uh, now gone from here are the, the important ideas to do with civil society, political citizenship, um, civil mindedness, all kinds of elements that simply go missing out of this uh, flattening this placing of education into this very restricted category called human development. And indeed, the idea of an economy, a global economy, as being reducible to these elements, globalization, and this is the OECD's conception of the knowledge economy, uh, research and development, uh, internet, uh, the number of highly skilled, which is human capital, and multinational enterprises. The bank itself has got its own version of this, um, and crucial in the, the World Bank's version of the knowledge economy is this idea that you have uh, kind of liberal market economies. Now, you can see what begins to happen when we actually locate countries. So we now have nominalization, and now we're going to do the next, and commensuration education equals the possibility of generating a knowledge-based economy. And now what we do is this. We actually place them in a hierarchical relationship to each other um, around these different kinds of categories. No surprise here that at the top, so the top 10, so this is the World Bank's knowledge assessment methodology that, uh, that uh, it, it still has many indicators. You can actually now rank the top 10 and you can rank the bottom numbers of countries that it's collected uh, data on. Um, in essence, what we might see here is just a different version, but now more granulated than the kind of version that uh, we saw earlier to do with the placement of the world into the developed, the developing, the underdeveloped, and the wrong-headed uh, development. And there are all kinds of ways in which you can actually make elements uh, visible, and these are simply some examples of the way you can actually cut through this data uh, and begin to, and here we see the, the, these, the spider graph, the Kindleberger representation here. Uh, we can actually look at particular slices of time, uh, and I took a slice, uh, 1995, and then maybe you can compare it with another period, 2005, or you can plot countries uh, a, a, along um, a, a particular um, a path forward. The point here is that what's happening is that now we've got forms of commensuration at work and for forms of equivalence. Okay? All these different countries, um, and let's just remind ourselves, are all placed on the same kind of trajectory here. Okay? A trajectory that essentially reduces itself to this. We have flattened the earth significantly. We have flattened education significantly. 
disappeared from here are deep social inequalities, forms of colonization, um, geographies of difference. We could go on and on, but my point is clear. So comparative frameworks then require normative ca categories on at least two levels. The entities to be compared must be distinct yet similar. And this requires a principle by which to ascertain distinction. And in the case I'm looking at here, globally competitive education economies. Data-driven, uh, collecting all data through these different kinds of indicators. To draw distinctions demands difference, and with every spectre of difference comes the possibility of hierarchy and of relations of domination and subordination, says Mongier. But different governing technologies have their own program ontologies, and the well-known work of uh, Pawson, Ray Pawson, and Tilly. Um, and here, then, we begin to see something different at work. Uh, prior, uh, there had been, and the OECD had been, ever since its inception, deeply interested in both data and forms of comparison since its uh, early beginnings uh, in 1957, but in 1962, when the OECD actually then replaces the uh, European uh, Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation. Uh, so it brings forward, uh, but now it begins to ramp up uh, the kinds of ways, the suite of governing technologies, that over time it begins to perfect. And here what we have is what I'm going to call vertical vision. This idea, and again, we, now we've got uh, a new uh, way of representing, so the politics of representation driven through data, as we can see, uh, locates uh, across different areas, science, uh, reading, and mathematics. Uh, this was a representation that Andreas Schleicher actually took to the United States, uh, pushing the United States, particularly in the World uh, Teaching Summit, to begin to think differently about uh, its education policies. But vertical vision, essentially, here, actually means that now we arrange, we have an, we have an ordinal set of arrangements, okay? In contrast with more ho horizontal maps, which nominal judgments evoke, so we can kind of plot things out and we can see, actually, if we looked at the um, wrong, under, developing, and developed, there's a kind of teleology. You would sort of get there. The way this one actually works, two identities, two nations, cannot inhabit the same rung of the ladder. So in contrast with horizontal maps, which nominal judgments evoke, ordinal ones typically operate according to a vertical polarity of relative positions on an up versus down scale. So ordinal positions imply relative positions and thus evoke uh, and thus different valuations. But the interest in relative rank tends to magnify differences. And many of you, many of you here have probably had some interest or worked on, on PISA. And that actually uh, the, the difference between sometimes a three and a four is so fractional, but nevertheless, these ordin the way ordinality kind of works, it actually generates these clear uh, differences. With vertical vision, we also get something different um, here, particularly with the OECD. Uh, but we could use the times higher, uh, invokes different modalities of power. Space, use of vertical space, time, keeping it on your temporal horizon. The times higher particularly does that. Um, last week I was actually um, keynoting, or doing a keynote, uh, where the Times Higher had actually launched the Central Asia strategy. Um, and funnily enough, Central Asia, um, or Eurasia actually, uh, Eurasia actually stopped quite neatly uh, between Turkey and Russia and all the bits in the middle. Uh, much of the rest of Europe and much of the rest of Asia also in this one simply went missing. Affect is incredibly important. This idea, the mobilizing of affect, affect guilt, shame, um, and so on. Um, I won't say that much about scale, but let, let's, let's see the kind of affect that, that vertical vision actually has on nations or indeed on individuals. A distinct sense of vertigo, a sense that the world is moving potentially, um, and I saw that, um, I've seen that in institutions, but you can also think of 
nations, and Germany is the good example of here, this, of where essentially the rules of the game uh, are simply not in your control. The encoder, those who are the code makers, okay, have actually now constructed, those who occupy the field of symbolic control, have actually constructed a different set of rules. And suddenly, where you are on this um, vertical uh, vision map uh, essentially uh, gives you a distinct sense of, un of unease. So vertical vision uh, also has what Foucault calls its unhingements. In other words, those who lose in the race and who, who need, who, whose uh, possibilities, whose fortunes, uh, the politics of resentment and so on begin also to potentially play out. Organisation promises everyone, all now placed in a hierarchical relationship to each other, that they can improve through learning from those above. But of course, this is a vertically organised race. Again, there has to be, by definition, winners and losers. So this is a game some will never, ever win. I'll come back to this, uh, this idea that increasingly, uh, across many spheres of our social life, we are placed in these multiple forms of what uh, Foucault and Healy are calling uh, classification si situations. Where are we classified in terms of our education um, uh, situation? Where are we classified in terms of our credit? And if you thought of the higher education world, and particularly in the UK, uh, your credit worthiness, uh, all kinds of classifications will be actually put t together. Nevertheless, what happens is that the outcomes, those who win, those who lose, uh, in, at least in the case of the UK, um, the fallout, the outcomes, are presented to us as hot spots and cold spots. The ignominy here is that you actually get treated with more of the same kind of logic um, and, and at the same time more marketing. Um, so that essentially a, a hot spot is uh, an opportunity to sell you more of the things that made you successful. A cold spot is actually to, se to sell you more treatments. This is the UK's representation of the hot spots and the cold spots. And we can actually see that uh, this uh, breaks itself down into local authorities and regions. And you can actually begin to see uh, quite quickly here that uh, this is uh, this is actually gener this this actually generates uh, all kinds of uh, resentments. Okay. Bernstein suggests uh, when we're thinking about policies and the idea of a pedagogical device, which I would want to argue that these are forms of very particular kinds of pedagogical devices, is that they, in the process of implementation, actually encounter different kinds of regulative fields, different kinds of pedagogical fields, different kinds of uh, commercial fields that actually begin to work as um, mechanisms that enable forms of contestation, interpretation, mediation and resistance. So this is not a linear relationship. Uh, essentially, as it moves through global space, what we begin to see is the possibilities for interpretation, uh, mediation um, and so on. Funnily enough, actually, uh, in the, the case of the UK, uh, the cold spots included some of the middle class. Some of that middle class, the upper working class, lower middle class, voted to leave. Quite well-educated young people in cold spots who felt that actually, though they're well-educated, that actually they don't have a future in the UK. Not the kind of example necessarily, but the kind of example, it was a very interesting example of um, forms of recontextualization. Okay, these are real people, real bodies, real ambitions, real aspirations, real thoughts of possibilities and a sense of despair and forms of unhingement. Nevertheless, the investors are drawn in. And to see like an investor in the world of education is to actually see all kinds of possibilities uh, whether it's for those who are the fallen angels or those who are the flying angels, uh, a possibility of selling something. Now, for capitalism to function today, says man, uh, tomorrow, to function today, tomorrow must be capitalist. Okay? The future is the premise of the present. 
And here, then, you'll see many of the big corporations have been very busy with the uh, global trade negotiations. There are multiple on the agenda um, and attempting to lock in um, this kind of way of organizing society. Competition, individual responsibility, vertical vision, uh, competitivism, and so on. Because essentially what this is generating is those possibilities for investment in two different directions through the market to do with those who uh, Foucault talks about as the forms of unhingement and those who essentially are actually on their way. Cold spots then, and these are, this is an education investor firm, 2018, a big show that will happen in October. Uh, go and have a look at this and you'll see all kinds of products um, there, uh, all kinds of firms waiting to sell uh, a treatment from the market uh, to the cold spot. Uh, but hot spots too are new investment opportunities for market investors. And here what you can see is Parthenon now is tied up with Ernst & Young and is identifying opportunities in so-called emerging markets. So let me just begin to, uh, in, in a light way, suggest uh, what some of this argument has been about. Um, I don't want to say this is a, a crude, but essentially what, what I'm wanting to argue is that uh, with a kind of more calon, a kaon kind of a, account of numbers to performativity, what you can begin to see here, it seems to me, is quite a lot of the conceptual um, resource that we might use to develop a soci sociology of quantification actually is sitting in that column that Bernstein has been um, working over and certainly the idea of the pedagogic uh, device. Okay? Field of symbolic control, rules of recognition, so how would we recognize categories, what's the way in which you would operate in that category as we in a, implement uh, what are the kind of rules, what happens to the so-called pedagogic device of which fundamentally these uh, forms of governing are forms of pedagogic uh, device. Uh, unhingement for Bernstein essentially is these decentered identities. Um, and essentially what uh, Bernstein would then be arguing, um, and I hope he would be arguing, is that essentially as we move into a new social world and world order, a global world order, then what we need is a new language of description. For Card's work, uh, and you see this here on the uh, left-hand side, is potentially uh, interesting because she begins to challenge uh, what she would say would be the idea of the calculating individual, the rational calculating individual. Um, individuals uh, ne don't necessarily always calc, and her argument here, and it's something I have, I think, said for quite some time, it's important that we don't uh, confuse uh, neoliberal ideology with our own analytics. Okay? Um, individuals can be quite irrational as well as rational. Um, so running down on this uh, left-hand side, uh, she's beginning to, and I'm not going to explore this here, begin to uh, develop some ideas around a shift from class for it in itself to this idea that individually we, we, we exist in these multiple sets of classifications, just as I showed you different countries, but we could place individuals. Um, scoop up to the top end all of these uh, multiple uh, locations at the high end of the vertical vision index, and in her estimation or in her argument, essentially we have some kind of uber capital. I think that's uh, part of a research agenda. I'm not sure I'm convinced by that. Um, De Rosier, uh, essentially, uh, the kind of language, and uh, many of them uh, working in this area around uh, measurement and uh, numbers, uh, are, are simply r working with categorization, commensuration, and measurement and statistics. But what I, I want to leave you with is uh, essentially what I think could actually be a proposal an agenda, that essentially as we work our way down and we look at some of the absences theoretically, conceptually, um, along these different columns, we might actually move some of that conceptual resource into this right-hand column here and uh, actually uh, look at the way in which we uh, think around not just the category makers, which uh, de Rosier's work doesn't include, 
uh, category making, so how do we make categories, um, the mechanisms in context, and here this would include how the dynamics of algorithms and different kinds of algorithms, different kinds of platforms, they're not all the same. Um, how do we actually, if we're using ordinality, okay, so we use vertical vision to put it quite simply.